Indy West 17. Mike should just do everyone a service, not review this terrible show, meaning NXT 2.0. I'd much rather hear his thoughts on Starcade 87. Really? Man, that's bad. That is bad. I actually went into the uh, went into the forum uh, last night to see if anybody was talking about the NXT 2.0 show, and it was two pages long. This is about an hour after the show was over. I think it's made it to three so far, and that is it. I and I'm not trying to bury the show because obviously, you know, there's 480 thousand people at least uh, between what 480 and 640, seemingly a week to watch NXT. But uh, it is uh, not knocking them dead for uh, for members of Figure4Online.com, and there really wasn't a whole lot of talk other than other than the one. Uh, video clip or the one gif out there of Cora Jade and the botchamania moment with the skateboard attacking Roxanne Perez, which, you know what, some people would look at as a sign that, you know, really? You you just had them win the tag titles. You have two people that are, are probably perfect together as a team for now, and you have to immediately break them up while they're still holding the belts. I'll try to get through this report as fast as I can. The show opened up with a video package reviewing what happened last week during the bash. We cut to outside in the parking lot where we find a battery of referees and officials, including what I swore was Drake Maverick doing William Regal cosplay, like with the hair and in a black suit and everything. But uh, they were all tending to Roxanne Perez, who was writhing on the ground in pain, her best friend in the whole wide world. Her brand new NXT Women's Tag Team Championship partner Cora Jade just happened to be there trying to trying to help her out. There is nowhere on the planet more dangerous than that performance center parking lot. That is for sure. I hope better things happen to people at, at full sale and places like that. But my God, nasty things happen in that performance center parking lot. It was then time for Vic Joseph and Wade Barrett to actually properly introduce the show with Vic saying the attack had the fingerprints of toxic attraction all over it, pointing out that Mandy Rose had made the claim initially that, well, she wasn't even going to make it to the match, uh, meaning Roxanne Perez. Barrett, of course, disagreed. He began to argue and said it could have been somebody else. First thing out of his mouth, like her own partner or Thea Hale or Amari Miller. They went with this whole storyline throughout the entire show. And I misstepped from Wade, a misstep of somebody speaking into his ear. You know, they made this a whole story, you know, whole storyline throughout the show and really, you know, turned the heat on to all of the heels when Mackenzie Mitchell asking all of them if they had anything to do with the attack. Even Nikita Lyons had to come out later and, and say that she didn't have anything to do with the attack. So I don't know if Barrett saying, well, like her own partner, uh, in hindsight, may have not have been the best, especially with the way things turned out. But. It was on to our first match, Giovanni Vinci against Apollo Crews. One real cool spot in this, and it it was very contrived because, again, how else are you going to do something like this? And I shouldn't say contrived, but it was, if there's a way to pull this move off where it looks a little bit more natural, I cannot wait to see it. Apollo was on the second rope, dove off towards Vinci, who caught and and you know basically you know, went like a dolphin diving out of the water so it like it was like Vinci standing up it's not like he was going to do a senton on top of him but the way he went into Vinci Vinci caught him in suplex position Cruz's feet never hit the ground and Vinci slowly brought him up for a full vertical suplex and dropped him Good stuff right there. I mean, great core strength, and it looked for both guys, and it looked really, really cool. The end came when both guys were outside the ring, and a guy tried to stand up and take a picture of Giovanni Vinci. Vinci grabbed his phone, rolled into the ring. The referee grabbed the phone, threw it out of the ring. But when Apollo Crews was going to get back into the ring, a guy from the stands jumped out. No surprise, Zion Quinn, the guy he was beefing with last week in all black and a red hat. Apparently he was standing out there for most of the match. 
attacked Apollo Crews, threw him in the ring. Vinci hit the sit-out, last ride powerbomb, and that was that. You know, I was surprised. I thought Vinci was, like, I, I don't know how tall Apollo Crews is. He always looked so short compared to some of the monsters. Obviously, Davicato and the people that were around him. Uh, but, you know, Vinci is just about the same size as Apollo Crews, which... You know, kind of is a little disappointing for me because I do like this character, but obviously height matters. Brian talks about it. We talk about it on the show every day. It's why Duke Hudson and Zion Quinn and all those guys love to bring up their height and how they look in a suit because Vince loves that. He loves big guys who look good in suits. Hey. We'll see what happens with Vinci, but I, I like the deal right now, and he boy is he good a good worker. So Mackenzie Mitchell at that point interviewed Cora Jade. Jade played Toxic Attraction for the attack on Perez. Uh, she said she knew that she and Roxanne should have arrived together and that those three bitches will have hell to pay if Perez can't wrestle tonight. We go to break. We come back. Tiffany Stratton is in the, the nail shop getting her getting her nails done. And long story short, she'll be keeping her eye on whoever wins the title match tonight. She then buried her nail tech. <laughs> to the manager before leaving. Cameron Grimes then came out in dress clothes to address the crowd after his loss last week to Braun Breaker at the Bash. He was distraught about losing the match and not being able to keep his word, said he was in the best shape of his life, had a game plan, and, and even caved in Braun, but then said he learned that you can do everything the right way and still not succeed. Says that's life, though. He was trying to go to the moon, but instead he crashed into the sun. As he does say that, J.D. McDonough comes out, mic in hand, runs Grimes down for having a kid pity party, and now that he's lost to Braun, he's old news. McDonough has says the game has changed now that he's there, and it led to Grimes calling him a posterior cavity. We'll just go ahead and go with that one. McDonough hit Grimes with a headbuck and then whipped him into the ropes, but when Grimes reversed it, McDonough held on and bailed, so... We're going to be getting at least some action between those guys before McDonough moves on and faces off against Braun Breaker for the NXT title in the direction that looked like they're going after McDonough attacked Braun after his match with Grimes last week. Camera faded to the back where Damon Kemp and the Creed Brothers are doing film study. The Creed Brothers and Kemp still on good terms, even though Roderick Strong's been a pain. Kemp says they'd love to run the match back. The Creed's accepted. They leave the room. And as Creed continues, or as Kemp continues to watch the screen, the film goes dead. It's Roderick Strong, who's actually pissed off at him for saying that he wants to run it back and instead challenges him to a one-on-one -on -one match next week. I don't know what Roderick Strong's contract status is, but I, I, I just look at Ivy Nile, the Creeds, and now Damon Kemp there. Maybe they're, they're causing a divide between him and Roderick Strong. Again, I don't know what his situation is there, but... Looks like that team could be splitting in full. I thought maybe just the Creeds and Ivy would go. It looks like they may be splitting that whole thing in two, but we'll have a little bit more on that next week. Caden Carter and Katana Chance. That one's for you, boss man. They came out for their ring intro, complete with smoke machines in their hands before they went to break. When we got back, McKenzie interviewed Grayson Waller. He's ticked at Wes Lee for causing him to lose the North American title match against Carmelo Hayes last week. Says that because Lee's life sucks... There's no reason to, to ruin his. We then got a quick shot of Cora Jade and the medical personnel in the back working on Roxanne before we hit the ring for Caden against Tatum Paxley. Hopefully I did him justice there. These two have been going at each other backstage for the last few weeks, and we see those moments, uh, as well as Ivy Nile uh, inviting Paxley to join the dojo for training last week. After a couple minutes, uh, like literally, Nile, uh, Nile came down to the ring to help coach Paxley up. Match did not go very long at all. Uh, Paxley was stuck in a leg lock. She made her way to the ropes where Ivy gave her some inspiration, gave her a deep look, and, and gave her some support. And then out of nowhere, Paxley ended up small packaging Carter for the victory. So that feud looks like it may continue, and it looks like we may have an official new tag team. And considering what may be happening with those belts, probably a good time for it. Joe Gacy and his hooded fellows are then standing out in the dark. I believe one of the smoke machines that the girls had was was in the background there. And uh, apparently the crew is now called the, uh, the Schism. The Schism. The Schism. The Schism. That's, that's not good. 
the druids and the the outfits aren't good either. But uh, apparently, they are going to be coming out of their shells next week and and going through a purification ceremony where we will find out their true identities and we'll find out exactly what the grizzled young veterans end up looking like as members of the Gacy Army. Sanga was backstage with some lady friends watching his cannonball into the pool last week during the bash opening skit. They get close to uh, Duke, oh, let's say, and then Duke Hudson came in. He wasn't happy about that cannonball. He was in the pool at the time and then suffered an ear infection, and he's really not happy about that. So the two decided to have a match tonight. After a break, Briggs and Jensen were shown drinking at a bar where Fallon Henley was the bartender. This was truly one of the show's highlights as Pretty Deadly came walking in in Western gear and, uh, yeah, uh, say some derogatory things towards Briggs and Jensen. They get close to having a bar fight, but Henley demanded they have a match next week instead. That goes into Sanga and Duke Hudson. Hudson got in a little bit of offense, got in a big boot to the face, but Sanga won after a couple minutes with a choke slam, so they're keeping him strong and just laying people out. Solo Sokoa against Von Wagner. Big Hoss battle here. Two guys who I'm sure they would love to have on the main roster. I don't think there's any question, unless the entire family quits, that Solo Sokoa will not be on that main roster. I can see him being in the Royal Rumble this year. And, boy, you know, I why they call him Solo Sokoa and not Nuso, I have no idea. It doesn't matter, though. He'll be up in the bloodline at some point. Long story short here, the match ended in a double countout, but it was not the end of this as they continued to brawl throughout the building for the rest of the night. Ultimately, that brawl ended up with Robert Stone in a trash can and actually, um, what's her name? Now I just, I, I blame brain locked on her name there, but uh, um, Sophia Cromwell was the one that actually was calming Wagner down and actually like de-escalating the situation. So I don't know if that's a sign for Stone being in that in that dumpster and they're going to continue to push with Sophia more. But there was a promo earlier on where Vaughn cut Stone off and cut his own promo at the camera. And it was not spectacular, but it was very good. Also very good. A great vignette with Trick Williams and Carmelo Hayes celebrating their greatness. They have four women with them. They want to party. So Carmelo says, Wait, well, let's go up to the penthouse. They're drinking champagne. They're in the pool. They're making a toast over being the A champion on the A show and just being great because, well, that's all it is. And that's all it's going to be. Lash Legend promo talking to Indy Hartwell before their match. Leads into an Alba Fire tease. <laughs> match was match was Indy Hartwell against Last Legend. Unfortunately, there was a botch at the end for Indy where she jumped onto the top rope. Uh, basically, what happened? Alba Fire came out, distracted Last Legend, and then um, uh, Indy Hartwell went outside the ring. Was going to jump in, do a springboard back in. Unfortunately, she busted her ass. Quick thinking, Legend got the cradle or, or went to cover her, Indy Hartwell. Got an ugly-looking cradle, but it did the job. After it was over, Alba Fire went after Lash Legend with a bat, made her go run away. And then we got Tony D'Angelo and Stax against Edra Sanofi and Malik Blade. D'Angelo got the victory. Afterwards, Del Toro and Wild proved their loyalty to him by beating down Blade after the match. And that leads us in to the main event of the show. Can you wait? You're going to have to. In two and a half minutes, you'll find out the dramatic results of a skateboard breaking in midair. Wrestling Observer Live. Shame on me. Thought I had this thing timed out right. Apparently not. NXT 2.0 review continues. Nikita Lyons. She asked for promo time with Mackenzie because she kept getting DM'd on IG about people asking her about what took place at the beginning of the show and if she had anything to do with it. And she said no, but she would gladly take the place of Roxanne Perez if she needed to. Then it was time for Mandy Rose and Toxic Attraction to hit the ring. They started cutting a promo. The fans heckled her. Cora Jade's music interrupted. She came down to challenge Mandy. Mandy blew her off. And as, as Mandy begins to say, I'm going to give Roxanne Perez three seconds to get down here. Roxanne Perez's music hits. She comes limping down, selling her ribs. Jade tries to talk her out of the match, but she got in there anyway. 
good. It, it was good because Roxanne Perez is really good. And I'm, you know, Mandy was just fine in this match for what they needed it to be. Uh, Roxanne hit a pop rocks on the floor as she threw uh, Mandy back into the ring. Cora took off her NXT championship belt that she shares <laughs> with her and hit her in the back which led to a running knee from mandy for the victory afterwards roxanne perez is laying there asking why she's hurt and mandy rose picks up the skateboard and as she goes to hit her well you'll see it on botchamania it breaks apart as uh producer sean sent me the bottle that uh, Chris Jericho went to hit CM Punk with, it was kind of like that, just exploded before it ever got to her. So Perez and Cora Jade are no more because you can't have a friend in WWE. I'm glad you're all my friends, though. Even the ones that hate me, I love you. You're my people. Brian Alvarez is my people. He'll be back tomorrow. Thank you, Producer John. Thank you, Producer Dom. And I shall talk to you again after a while. This is how the show begins, really. Oscar gives a back kick, camera cut. She does a back fist, camera cut. She starts to run, camera cut. She gets a hip attack, camera cut. She drops to her knees, camera cut. She throws a kick, camera cut. She stands up and screams, camera cut to people brawling on the floor. I was furious, do you understand? I wanted to shut the show off and not watch anymore. If you enjoy these videos for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full length editions of the Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, the Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.